from Smart Bitch Modern Dog Training, but you could just call us Smart Bitch to be precise. Interested in training your dog? Excellent. You've come to the right place. However, there are 10 things you should know, and that's the whole point of this video. I'm going to give you 10 tips to know before you actually start training your dog. Stay tuned. Number one, the way you train your dog matters. The best way to train your dog is the rewards-based way or rewards-based training. Rewards-based training can be synonymous with force-free training or positive reinforcement training. The philosophy behind rewards-based training is to use rewards, not what scares or intimidates your dog to get them to work with you. Rewards-based training is scientifically proven to be the most humane and safest way to train your dog. It also produces lasting results. And in our opinion, it's the only way to train. The reason we are for rewards-based training methods is because using aversive training methods or punishment-based training methods can cause negative emotions or responses from your dog. Examples of punishment-based methods can be, but it's limited to, pushing a dog into a sit, pulling a dog's leash back to get them to stop pulling, or using any sort of tool or physical manipulation to get your dog to do what you want them to do. Let's expand on that further. For example, the most aversive training tool out there is the electronic collar, aka the shock collar. The shock collar goes on the dog, and the parent has a button that delivers a shock of varying levels to make the dog stop doing something. Let's say, let's pretend that she uses a shock collar to stop your dog from barking at strangers while on walks. Okay, well the shock collar will stop the barking in that moment. However, internally, your dog will start to associate the strangers with that shock. So, you made the problem worse now because now your dog will become even more fearful of strangers and will act out more aggressively to keep strangers away from it. That's really heavy. So, the point being, Positive trainers like the smart bitches want to focus on the root of the issue, not the symptoms. We want to focus on the fear, not the barking. However, we're going to discuss that topic in a different video. So, we want to use positive methods that will elicit positive feelings. Positive methods can include, but isn't limited to, using play, using praise, using um, physical affection, but our personal favorite is to use treats, which leads to our next tip. Tip number two. Use treats, but know that they all aren't made equal. <laughs> treats are the fastest and simplest way to train your dog. All dogs love food. However, depending on the situation, the food your dog likes will change. So have a variety of treats. Also, don't get hung up on the, oh, all dogs love peanut butter or stereotypical things you think dogs like. Your dog may not like peanut butter. So don't go in there with training with peanut butter expecting him to take it. Now, think of what gets you out of bed in the morning and go to work. That paycheck. Now, think about how much you can pay your dog to work with you. And most of the time, the answer isn't kibble. Here's why. First, there is a treat tier, three tiers to be precise, where I like to break treats up into low tier or low value, mid tier or medium value, or high tier treats, or high value treats. And for me, the scale goes from boring to fun. Low tier treats are typically kibble. Why? Because they're boring. Kibble is boring. Dogs eat kibble pretty much every single day, so they're used to that flavor, and you probably won't get them too motivated by that. A good example of this is that I'm from New Orleans. I used to eat red beans every single Monday when I was a kid, so now, Red beans do not motivate me. So please don't feed me red beans. <laughs> the entire idea behind a treat is to get them motivated. And if they get it too often, they won't be motivated by it. Moving from low tier, let's go to mid tier treats. Now in my experience, mid tier treats, good ones, have been soft treats. Soft treats like Zooks or the train meat treats, the treats you can find at Walmart, Home Goods, Marshalls, TJ Maxx, those really good potent soft treats. Those are really good mid tier treats. The reason I call these mid-tier is because they, way, they are way better than kibble, but they're not as high value as some of the high value treats I have coming up next. Now, high value treats can be called the good shit, or dog crack, or whatever your dog goes bonkers for. Now, in my experience, high value treats have been peanut butter, um, hot dogs, boiled chicken, deli meat, um, cheese, all the really good stuff, wet food, tuna, these are all treats that I can consider high value because most dogs go bonkers for them and they rarely get these treats. 
Am I missing something from my list? What high budget treat you like to feed your dogs? Let us know in the comments below. Now we know more about the three tiers of treats, know when to use the right treats in certain situations. For example, if you're working in a highly stimulating environment like your backyard, you will need a highly engaging treat or a higher value treat to keep your dog's attention on you. You have to beat the environment. If your dog sees a squirrel, do you have a treat that's better than that squirrel? Eh, probably not yet. That being said, it's always best to have a variety of treats if you're working outside of the home. However, if you are at home and your dog is taking kibble, a low value treat, keep using kibble. There is nothing wrong with that. And you know your dog is interested in the treat if they are consistently looking for where the treats are. If they aren't interested, it's time to go up on that treat tier. I also like to bring kibble up because you can use your dog's meal times as training time. Maybe lunch becomes training time or maybe dinner. The possibilities are endless. And for my folks out there worried about becoming dependent on treats, just know that treats are not forever. They can be phased out. However, you just started training, so you will continue to use treats, okay? Now, I've been showing treats a lot of love. However, the beautiful thing about rewards-based training is that anything can be a reward for your dog. You can be a reward. However, for now, let's take the treats and let's move on to our next tip. Tip number three, dogs do not understand English. They understand that body though. Dogs can be taught to understand two different types of cues. And if you haven't gone through training, they already understand certain cues from you already. And primarily those cues are visual cues. A visual cue is something that is visually telling your dog to do something. Example of that is the hand signal for sit, the hand signal for down, or you putting your hand in front of your dog to stop, or you're leaning over slightly, which convinces your dog to sit. These are all visual cues. Dogs tend to understand these visual cues well because dogs communicate primarily via body language. And even though humans aren't dogs, our dogs have become in tune to us to figure us out. Now, going back to treats for a moment, let's talk about a certain technique, the luring technique. The lure can be positioned in certain ways, body language again, to get your dogs to move in certain ways. And I have a demo of that lure coming up. Okay, let's talk about the lure. So the lure sounds exactly how it sounds. I'm using my dog's sense of smell to guide them into certain positions or to follow me by using a treat. So for example, Sashi, come. Good girl. I have a treat right here in my hand. She wants it, she's following my hand, which is really cool. Now let's pretend Sashi did not know sit. I will take this lure and then guide it over her head. And usually as the head goes up, the butt falls down. And as a good girl, she sat. Welcome back. So now the lure is turning into hand signals to cue your dog to do certain behaviors. And now you have sign language with your dog, which is pretty damn cool. The other type of cue is the human overlord's favorite, the verbal cue. We love to talk. Verbal cues are verbal cues that are telling your dog to do something verbally. <laughs> Example of that is sit for sit or down for down. And like I mentioned earlier, dogs don't speak English. So technically, that will make verbal cues the least effective of the two cues. However, as you already know, we can assign meaning to certain words and turn them into verbal cues by using visual cues first. With practice, just using a verbal cue can work. Verbal cue. Sir, can you sit? Good girl. Smart bitch's favorite thing to do though is to combine the verbal cue with the visual cue. Can you sit? Yes, good girl. With this technique, your dog is almost guaranteed to perform the behavior requested because you're coming at them from two senses, sound and sight. Another fun fact is that your dog's name is also a verbal cue. Number four, market. So, you have treats, but your dog doesn't really necessarily know why you're treating them. Here's why. You also need to mark when you're doing something correctly. So you need to mark and then treat them. These marks are called positive markers. Positive markers can be a simple yes or good boy or any word, positive word, that you wanna use that is a part of your natural vocabulary. However, refrain from using this marker word around your dog unless you are actually marking behavior. The best positive marker is the clicker. 
The clicker is the best positive marker because it is a clear and concise sound and is a very consistent sound. It always sounds the same if you're using the same clicker. Meanwhile, your good boys may not sound the same and they certainly don't sound the same if you have multiple trainers in your household or if you have multiple family members training that same dog. So my good boy may be different from your good boy. Hope that makes sense. Now, more about markers, whatever you choose. Well, all markers, you must charge them to give them meaning. And I hope this demo helped you out. I have a clicker right here. I hide it behind my back, like so. To charge the clicker, all I'm gonna do is click and then give her a treat. Click and then give her a treat. Click and then give her a treat. I'm gonna do that so many times that she started, she's gonna start understanding that the click means a treat. It is basic classical conditioning. Good job, good job, good job. So I do that for a good minute or so, and then after a while, stop. Get your dog to be distracted by some, something, let them listen to something else, and then click, good job. If they look back at you, you know that they have grasped the meaning of it. Meaning that the moment Sasha looked up because she heard that click, she was looking for a treat. So she understands click means treat. Meanwhile, if she did not look at me, I will go back and charge and click a little bit longer. What the smart bitches like to do, and we recommend you doing it too, we like to pair our positive marker word with the clicker, just so we can have both in our arsenal. No matter the marker, the rule is all the same. If you click or say yes to a dog giving you a sit, you only have about three seconds to deliver that reward or the meaning will be lost. The opposite markers are negative markers. You are marking when your dog does something wrong and you're probably already doing this. Saying no, saying uh-uh, saying stop. These are examples of negative markers. However, I challenge you to wait your dog out. Using too many negative markers will make your dog frustrated and not want to work with you. So again, if they're not doing it, if they're struggling, walk away, walk back to them, ask for it again, they do it, yes, mark it and then give them a treat. Furthermore, there are other issues with negative markers that I'm gonna to touch on in my next tip. Silence is golden and patience is key. Remember when I mentioned that the smart bitch is trained in silence? Well, there's a reason for it. That reason is a term called learned irrelevance. Learned irrelevance in this sense means that a cue that used to hold meaning for the dog no longer does. This often happens when people repeat cues, thinking that it will get the dog to do the behavior faster. In reality, you're turning yourself into the Charlie Brown teacher and now your words don't mean a thing. We see this a lot in homes with kids. The kids repeat the dog's name so much that the dog has started to either ignore it or only answer after certain numbers of times. Fido, 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 come. Well, now his name is Fido, 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 Fido. We don't want this happening to you guys. It will only get worse from here. Instead, only say your cues once, which includes your dog's name. You will never break your cues if you only say them once and always follow them up with reinforcement or rewards. Repeating cues stems from impatience. However, you must be patient on your dog's dog training journey or they will never learn properly. Also, make sure you are in the right state of mind before you start training your dog. Training a dog after a very frustrating day of work may not be the best idea. Tip number six, dogs are very literal. They don't generalize well. Okay, so dogs do not generalize well, meaning they are not good at applying a concept to many different situations. For example, for humans, one plus one equals two, no matter where we go. However, for a dog, sit only equals sit where they have practiced. The awesome thing about training is that dogs can be taught to generalize better. Let's say, for example, we have person A. Person A taught his dog how to sit in the bedroom. However, after that, he practiced it in all the rooms of the house. After all the rooms in the house have been practicing, he brings it outside. Now we have person B. Person B taught his dog to sit in his bedroom, and then he took it outside. Now, which one of these dogs is going to generalize sit better? Person A or person B? It's going to be person A. Person A has practiced sit in many different scenarios and situations, so this dog will have an easier time applying sit to many different situations, including the outside world. However, 
Generalizing or helping a dog generalize may not always be that simple. So it's always important to make sure that the environment that you're practicing in isn't too stimulating and to make sure that your treats are engaging enough. Number seven, set your dog up for success, not failure. Very important tip. Maybe your puppy has been acting very fearful lately or going through a fear stage. Maybe your dog is extremely aggressive towards strangers while on leash. Maybe your dog is extremely excitable to watch strangers while on leash. One thing you shouldn't do with these dogs is try to train them in the middle of Home Depot in the middle of their rush hour. That spells disaster. Please don't do that, guys. We want our dogs to be in a learning state of mind. Being too excited or too fearful will hinder our dog's ability to learn, no matter what treats you have. Oftentimes, Dogs like these need the help of a professional positive trainer, so don't shy away from hiring one. So, always set your dog up for success by cataloging their strengths and weaknesses. You'll be surprised by what your dog isn't ready for. This leads to our next tip. Number eight, management. management. So, while you actively train your dog, you should also be actively managing them. Management in this sense means that you are structuring your dog's environment in a way to prevent unwanted behavior. For example, if you are training your dog to sit instead of jump at guests coming through the front door, then you should actually have a management system in play to prevent your dog from actually getting to that front door. Your management system could be, but is limited to, having your dog on leash when guests arrive or installing baby gates in your home to limit their space. The idea is you are lessening the chances of the jumping to happen, which will make your sit instead training catch on a lot quicker. Positive reinforcement training does not mean that we are permissive trainers. We simply use management techniques to prevent the behaviors we do not like. For example, if you have a dog that reacts aggressively while on leash, some of your management techniques may include walking this dog only during low traffic times, and also avoiding this dog's triggers while on walks. And most importantly, every situation that comes up with your dog is not a training opportunity. In fact, situations that aren't planned for should be avoided at all costs or to the best of your ability. This is the entire idea behind management. Just do it. Number nine, be your dog's guide or teacher, not their alpha. Dogs do not try to dominate you. Your dog is not that cute, you guys. Dogs simply do what works for them, cause and effect. For example, some dogs jump on you to get closer to your face because they love you. And also because someone, if you're not doing it, is giving them attention in some way while they are jumping. Touching their head, pushing them off, saying off. All of this is still attention to some dogs. So it is working for them, the jumping is working cause and effect, I jump, I get attention in some way. As their guide, identify what you do that affects your dog's behavior. Once you identify what you do, you can stop doing that and also start rewarding your dog for doing what you like instead. Now ask yourself, what can you train them to do to help you accomplish this, to help them accomplish this? For example, in my household, I don't want my dogs charging towards the door when strangers come in. So I taught my dogs to place themselves on chairs when strangers do come in. I made a very clear and concise path for them, training-wise. We ask you to do the same, exactly what you want them to do. You want them to go into a place, or you want them to stay on the floor for a pause on the floor? What is it? Number 10, every little success counts, no matter how little it may seem. Again, every little success counts. For example, your barking dog was able to be quiet for five seconds while a stranger walked in. That's amazing, take that. Or your unpotted trained dog only had one accident this week, take it. That is amazing, guys, take it. To aid with your dog's training journey, the smart bitches always tell our clients to arm their home, but with treats. Most people have treats in their home. However, the treats aren't available when they actually need them. So get little Tupperwares, place them in different rooms in your home, and put non-perishable treats in these Tupperwares. And that way, you can have a treat handy when your dog actually does something you like, which is the next point. If you like it, reward it. 
We as humans tend to focus a lot on the bad things our dogs do, ignoring the equal or sometimes greater amount of good they do. So we challenge you to mark and reward your dog whenever you see them doing something you like. We can tell you that you're going to start seeing problem behavior decrease and you're going to be rewarding them a lot because they're going to be doing a lot of good things that you didn't notice before. And last but not least, training doesn't go like a straight line or an incline to the top. There will be good days and bad days. However, if you follow the advice mentioned previously, you'll shake off the bad days with grace and continue trucking along on you and your dog's training journey. So, good luck and happy training, guys.